I don't think the Russians can project force the way they can in the other places. And then that, and I think that goes also for Crimea, that uh, I, I've got to believe that uh, Ukrainians are going to find a way to knock down the Kerch Bridge, as they've damaged it twice in the last year, um, year and a half. Um, um, and that would be a major blow uh, for sustaining Ukraine, uh, excuse me, sustaining Crimea, let alone um, allowing it to be an offensive um, um, uh, uh, platform. So, yes, it's uh, the, the, Ukra the, the Ukrainians have been very agile, var very nimble. They're targeting. They've used a whole plethora of weapons, everything from cruises to, cru uh, cruise missiles to uh, drones to sea drones uh, and sabotage we've read about as well. And uh, they won't stop. Hello and welcome to Frontline for Times Radio. I'm James Hansen. And today we're talking about the latest on the war in Ukraine with Peter Zwack, a retired Brigadier General who served for 34 years in the US Army as an intelligence officer before becoming the US's senior defence attaché to the Russian Federation between 2012 in 2014. General Zwack, always appreciate your time. Welcome back to Frontline. Thank you for having me. Let's just begin with the news we've had in the last 24 hours that Ukraine has sunk the Caesar Kunikov, a Russian amphibious ship off the coast of Crimea. First of all, what do we know about the attack so far and how much significance would you place on it? Well, I think we need to, um, we need to see uh, the, the follow on reporting. Um, uh, th these are of the Russian Kapucha class amphib vehicles, which are pretty big, strong vehicles. I've seen them emit uh, troops, uh, vehicles um, on an exercise in Kaliningrad back when we could as attaché as his latest 2013. They're serious. And, um, and what they're doing by taking out these amphibious um, ships, whether they break, uh, destroy them, or, or badly damage them is it limits the Russians' ability, friends, to, to uh, get on the shore, do amphibious landings if they wanted to do in the portion of the Black Sea between Crimea and Odessa. Uh, so, um, and the weapons, well, we've seen they've used these sea drones, uh, they've fired Neptune missiles. Um, uh, it could be a combination of much, but the bottom line, is that uh, while the Russians, you know, have have uh, I think that I think the word now is stalemated the front along the east and all that, the Ukrainians, despite having any capital ships, have overmatch in the Black Sea, which is remarkable considering where we are in this war. But um, um, and and the Russians can't can't leverage uh, Crimea. Uh, into an attack base, which they would want to do, uh, and mostly they're playing defense in the region. So um, uh, that was a significant attack, whatever the uh, final uh, report is. Remember that Moskva, just, uh, just 22 months ago, I mean, it's insane how fast time has gone, friends, um, was sunk in the Black Sea between uh, between uh, Crimea and Odessa or Snake Island. So this is this is significant. I mean, as you say, Peter, what, what is so interesting is that it comes off the back of continued success for Ukraine in the Black Sea, obviously has a huge economic impact because it enables grain exports to resume. Symbolically, it's important. Strategically, it's important. But my question to you is, why has Russia not been better at defending the Black Sea fleet? Well, I think get it's a great question again. I think that the Russians probably have moved in, uh, have moved in um, uh, a, a, a lot of S three hundred, S four hundred air defense systems. Um, um, they're leery of flying, if you will, um, fixed wing platforms too close to the Ukrainian um, coastline. Um, as they've been being shot down by fairly effective, uh, quite effective uh, and, uh, and well-deployed Ukrainian air defense, some of which your country and my country have provided. Um, um, Storm Shadow, the cruise missile of yours, has been just wreaking havoc uh, in Crimea and is, is, uh, is um, believed to be the system that hit the uh, Russian uh, headquarters 
uh, on Crimea a number of months ago. I think that it's um, um, I think that you've got sitting duck targets out there. Um, the Russians can't employ their customary mass like they do along the main front. Um, and uh, I just think that the Ukrainians are out thinking them and more nimble than they are, though the Russians are improving um, uh, all across the front. Do you think we will see Ukraine continue to be successful in targeting the Black Sea fleet? Do you think in a few months time we might be saying instead of a third of the Black Sea fleet eliminated, half of the Black Sea fleet has been eliminated? Well, I think that, um, uh, first of all, the Black Sea fleet is relatively uh, isolated because as if there are combatants going up there, they can't come up through the Dardanelles. And so only Russian um, uh, ship uh, production um, 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 uh, along that coastline, which has also been hit. I mean, you've had several Russian shipyards hit um, on the Russian side of the Black Sea, where a number of the Russian surface uh, combatants um, took harbor in. Um, I mean, and they recently sunk a corvette. They fire uh, caliber missiles. Uh, they um, uh, you know, damaged a submarine some time ago uh, and have made it very, very unpleasant for the Russians. So I, again, I don't think the Russians can project force the way they can in the other places. And then that, and I think that goes also for Crimea, that uh, I, I've got to believe that uh, Ukrainians are going to find a way to knock down the Kerch Bridge as they've damaged it twice in the last year, um, year and a half. Um, um, and that would be a major blow uh, for sustaining Ukraine, uh, excuse me, sustaining Crimea, let alone um, allowing it to be an offensive um, um, uh, uh, platform. So yes, it's uh, the, the, Ukra the, the Ukrainians have been very agile, var very nimble. They're targeting. They've used a whole plethora of weapons, everything from cruises to, cru uh, cruise missiles to uh, drones to sea drones uh, and sabotage. We've read about as well, and uh, they won't stop. Just on the the Kirsch Bridge, you mentioned there, General. Do you think Ukraine has the firepower as things stand? to destroy it or at least to render it effectively useless. I mean, we'll come on to shortly the increased military aid package announced by the Senate. Still got to clear the House of Representatives. But even if that goes through, does Ukraine have the firepower to do that at the moment? I believe the I believe the Ukrainians will figure out a way. I, I, I really, really do. It is a target, um, especially, you know, they have uh, better and, and, and more enhanced longer range uh, cruise missiles. Uh, something is going to break through. They've already hit it. Now, um, the the Kerch Bridge. Uh, I was in Moscow when they um, when they inaugurated it. I think it was 2019. To great fanfare. So this is uh, this is a Putin project, and and you could see how he threw himself into it. Um, and besides, you know, and amazingly, calling hitting the Kerch Bridge a criminal act. But he was in the first truck um, uh, crossing the Kerch Bridge upon its construction uh, back then. And uh, though this is a, an ego thing for him beyond an important um, military um, uh, and, and economic target. Last thing in the Black Sea um, is remarkable. And in originally, originally you had one of these strange during the war type negotiations between the uh, Russians, the Turks, um, United Nations, and the Ukrainians for that uh, for that um, sea sea channel, that sea uh, sea corridor um, for grain ships uh, to head down into um, out of the Black Sea, um, and that got stopped. The Russian role was stopped last fall, but the Ukrainians, with the help of regional nations. Ukrainians, uh, Romanians, and Bulgarians have opened up their their sea lines for it, and they are getting grain out, uh, um, though not in the volume they would like to. So the Black Sea is is a case study in improvisation, uh, agility, um, and kind of intelligently making things up as you go, and it's worked.
Now, I mean, that's the one front that is fluid, uh, where the main uh, Donetsk, uh, Donbass uh, front is, is, is pretty rigid. Let's come on to another area where Russia appears to be struggling at the moment, and that's tank losses. According to the London-based International Institute for Strategic Studies, Russia has now lost more tanks on the battlefield in Ukraine than were operational at the start of the full-scale invasion. What do you make of that? Well, it's 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 remarkable. Um, and um, you go to Ukraine, and and um, um, you see T-shirts and buttons, Saint Javelin. And, and, and things like that. Um, early on, we talked about the criticality of the big weapons like Atakums and HIMARS and, and Storm Shadow and all that. But it was the low level in the very beginning, anti-tank, anti-air tactical that saved the day in the first operations during that, that, that really, really, really scary um, uh, spring and early summer when many didn't think the Ukrainians could hold them off. Now, many of the Russian first line tanks, uh, um, especially the T-72B3 and then their T-80s and T-90s and, and, uh, T, uh, and T-70s, um, uh, all of which, uh, you know, have been, been badly handled by mostly uh, Ukrainian um, um, anti-tank and increasingly effective use of, of drones. Um, and um, the, um, the Turks early on in the war, they had the, uh, what is it, the Bayekar uh, drone that was um, enormously important and had made its name fighting um, on, with the Armenians against Russian tanks uh, just a, a couple of years before. Um, and, and so the heart of the pre-war Russian active duty tank force um, has been uh, destroyed and disabled. Now we're re now they're going into production. Uh, they're on a war footing and they're going to increase um, um, their production. But the re Ukrainians are still knocking out tanks. But what is interesting is, and you've read about this, um, a number of your viewers are from the Cold War and, and, and uh, remember, uh, remember NATO Warsaw Pact. And oh my God, we're seeing uh, T-62s again and T-64s and even early model um, 1950s T-55s uh, and, and stuff like that. And um, which just shows how deep into the uh, into the barrel the Russians are digging. Saying that they are getting new stuff, but but uh, but it's going to um, uh, take a, a, a long time. Uh, the uh, as a T fourteen Armada, everybody talked about their super tank, has been a no show. It's it was it was a. Uh, it, it 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 has it has only a few been out there, um, over engineered, and um, a failure seemingly in these environments. So yes, Russians will continue to throw tanks uh, at them. Obviously, they've learned some hard lessons um, um, using a lot of old models more and more, which has got to make a tanker really scary. Think about being a tank crewman or, you know, going down the way there and you're in a T-62 of the type that we're getting knocked out by tow missiles in great number on the Golan Heights in 1973 and in the Sinai. And, and if you're in, and you know, you're in a T-72 even, you know, you're in theory a good tank against a lesser foe, but you've seen you know, the, 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 you hit them a certain way with a javelin AT and the, and the turret blows off, you know, and the Ukrainians have a lot of them, too. So it's it's uh, scary in many ways. You, you have all that armor around you, but you now got to look ahead and now you got to look above to drones. Let's move on to the issue of Ukrainian supplies. We have finally had some good news this week from U.S. Congress. The Senate has approved $95 billion worth of military aid for Ukraine, but also for Israel and Taiwan as part of the package. Now, note of caution, 
still needs to pass the House of Representatives. Hopefully it will in the near future. What's your reaction to that, Peter? Well, I have to be careful about de getting deep into American politics. Saying that, I, I'm of the belief that we can do both. We can build our wall. Our border is important. And we can continue fulsome support to uh, Ukraine and, and to Israel um, and to Taiwan. We can do both. Now, we need our help from our allies, and the allies have more and more stepped up. I'm aware of that. That's become another issue. You know, the NATO 2% and everything else. Um, I know that I know I know, uh, James, that, that your country is really, really stepping up now in production. The Germans are. But um, it, it's politics. It's desperately unfortunate at this time. And what it does do is um, beyond just slowing down the munitions, which are going to mean you you have to really husband and count your artillery rounds. Um, and you don't want to do that in a high intensity war where the Russians are not or they're doing less so. They've sort of caught up on their uh, their, their production is much higher. But, um, um, you know, they're running out of running low in air defense and where the Russians have been basically non presence um, uh, over the immediate battle uh, lines because of air defense and. And, and SAMs and all that, you know, they, uh, they've got to count carefully. And then you look at, you know, long range uh, patriots and storm shadows and things like that. They're not cheap and they're not numerous. And you got to really, really husband them. So this, in my mind, um, personally, and I don't want to delve heavily into American politics. I try to be a centrist. Um, it's misguided. It's a it's a, a lack of awareness of history, um, um, obsession with party politics, um, and yes, the United States has a significant significant border problem, and the and 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 the government is is working on it. It's imperfect, and, and they've they, they've they've it, it's been really really bad getting there. But now they're they're on it. Um, in in my uh, in my uh, in, in our legislature, could have passed a bill that would give strong support, not perfect, but strong support in in rebuilding, if you will, the wall and the border 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 issues, but also getting, especially now, badly de needed munitions. Um, of, of all types, Ukraine in it. And, and James, it's more than that. It's, it's when you're in a mano a mano fight that the Ukrainians are on right now, uh, and you're losing, you know, arguably hundreds of people a day uh, in this, you know, in, in the type of warfare, God bless your country knows best, thinking back of 1916, 1917. Um, it, 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 it's, it's, the dangerous thing of all is if the Ukrainians in their fight when they've got moxie and they're motivated and it's existential, but if they start to, their, their hope starts to erode, they're, they're, is this just what it's going to be? It's going to be endless and they're going to grind us down. And you're seeing on the Ukrainian side, it would be in all our countries, a lot of the uh, young folks uh, that are being um, uh, mobilized don't want to go. That doesn't mean they're not patriots. They're terrified. They don't want to go and die. And especially if they get the sense that this thing is tipping into something hopeless. It isn't that now. Um, but um, I think that the, the, the stalling, um, um, the support um, certainly um, um, creates uh, beyond the material support creates a crisis of trust and confidence between, uh, frankly, us, the Americans, and their allies, uh, certainly for the Ukrainians. The Taiwanese are looking from afar. Um, um, and, um, uh, and oh, who else is watching closely is the Kremlin. And this gives, you know, this, this between that and then the Four months now of the horrific 
fight in Gaza and, and the Middle East, um, um, the one country that's probably benefiting most from it, you look at the strategic aggregate, is Russia. Because it's taken, it's taken much of my countries and, and, and our allies and the, what I call the free-minded world's attention away from Ukraine and fo forced it to focus not just not just attention but 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 weapons i mean the us navy is really really stretched out in that region and they still have to worry about the atlantic and they still have to worry about the indo pacific so 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 there are a lot of repercussions in just tying a spending bill um um, as as have happened in my country, where if you don't get the wall taken care of the way we like it, um, the Ukrainians aren't going to get their funding, and um, I just I think many of us, I would say most of us, were gobsmacked that uh, it looked like there was a bill, a bipartisan bill approved. In my government, and through uh, through uh, through um, the Senate, and it looked like it was going to be passed um, in Congress, and by, and behind the scenes, a certain alpha leader running for president said, "No, don't support it. It's bad. It's bad uh, that we can't use this as a campaign issue. I'm too deep into it, James." The bottom line, we've got to find a way to get weapons and 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 munitions uh, to Ukraine. Uh, convinced, you're not convinced, but reinforced to our allies, which we haven't done a good job in the last week, uh, that we are all in on NATO and the alliance, and um, and then and that we're all going to collectively stay the course. You know, and and I think a good thing. In all of this, and 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 the, what's remarkable is the exercise steadfast defender uh, twenty four is landing at this time. Now it's a pre planned exercise. Announced the Russians knew it was all happening, but think about the timing of this. Right in the middle of of all this, you know, issues and questions about support to Europe and Ukraine. Um, and what the Russians are doing or not doing. So it couldn't have come at a better time to help pull together, keep the alliance together. It's come so far in the last three years. Um, um, and, and so um, it's important. And then a little, you know, kind of, and, and there has been hints and pressure uh, in the Baltic region, all that, Putin flew into uh, Kaliningrad uh, uh, last month. You know, that, that's, that was just an interesting data point, sitting right there in the middle of the Baltics. Um, so a lot to think about. But Steadfast Defender, of which um, you have a sizable contingent in, and, and, um, um, and uh, the Prince of Wales, um, you know, uh, God bless you. And uh, we're all in. All right. We'll, we'll, we'll get through our politics. We're all in. And that's the message that needs to be the most dangerous part in all this. That's the message that needs to ring clear and hard in Vladimir Putin's in the Kremlin's ear that the uh, that the uh, NATO is unflinching and will come to the defense of any of its allies um, um, attacked, invaded, no matter what its size and where it is. Just finally, General, I wanted to ask you about the change in Ukraine's military leadership we've seen over the past week. General Zelushny has left his post. He's been replaced by General Sierski. How much do you know about General Sieski and do you think we're going to see a change in strategy on the front line as a result? I know the issue is I know the issue is 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 quite out there now. And um the discussion of uh, General Sierski um is is 
Yeah, he has a, um, first of all, he's a hard fighter, grew up in the Soviet system, uh, the old Russian system, but he is a proven hardcore fighter and Ukrainian patriots, a patriot. Now, debates in how, you know, how, um, uh, where uh, Valery Zaluzny, the outgoing commander, also hardcore, somehow, well, had a, a seemingly really quite great rapport with the soldiers and, um, um, and, and got along reasonably well with uh, Vladimir Zelensky, especially in the crisis period. Um, um, so, so that, that, um, that's that. And then, well, I think very, very importantly, we go back in history, <laughs> even the Americans and the British publicly ordered, uh, uh, argued over war strategy with our senior generals and leaders in the Second World War. I mean, I, I, I think, you know, Patton and Montgomery and I, all of that. So this is not abnormal in a, in a stressful situation. Think about it. These guys have been in intense, intense, whether you're on the front line or just straining your brain cells and energy, existential war of survival for almost two years. And things start to give, and there are differences of uh, of uh, tactics. Um, there, there are concerns that um, that the uh, new general um, is uh, a little bit um, um, more willing to get into tough. Uh, well, General Zuzny too, but but um, General Sirsky seemed to um, support just get in there into the pit and, and, and fight and tear and fight and gnaw to a point where, okay, we've done a really good job, we've, but maybe we've gone too far. Meaning at Bakhmut, uh, there was a debate, you know, should, um, should, um, should the Ukrainians at a certain point uh, withdraw to new defensive lines? Um, and not be um, uh, drawn into this fight. But, but at the same point, um, uh, um, President Zelensky, um, up to quite a point, supported holding Bakhmut. You have Avdivka going on right now. And the question there now is that uh, the Ukrainians have been putting up a hell of a fight for almost 10 months down there. Um, it's the new Bakhmut. But it is... Um, at what point, at what point, if if the charnel house, the 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 grind, the losses, um, uh, you know how strategically important is Avdivka or Bakhmut was, and if the Ukrainians are forced out of it or pull out of it, um. Is that a, other than, you know, the Russians will trumpet, you know, as a great victory and, and, uh, but the Ukrainian government can certainly say we, 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 we have, we have held, we fought mightily, uh, and we have blooded the enemy and we're going to, um, withdraw to more defensive lines and, 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 and protect our people. Um, and, and, and the new guy is seen to be at least the, 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 you know, the, you know the the gossip out there as as being a, a little bit more hardcore and ruthless in the expenditure of uh, units and personnel in uh, in uh, defensive fights. But he was there. He was uh, with Zaluzny directing the overall fight. The new guy um, um, was great in the defense. Of uh, Hark uh, of um, of Kiev in those early months, and also out of Kharkiv. So he's a proven fighter, um, and I think they're going to just have to work it out in a in a existential war where there's strong feelings and a lot of alpha people in there. You're going to have differences of opinion, major. And at a certain point, when they boil out into the public. 
you try to address them. And if not, you've got to make a change. That's what happened. Um, and maybe, and maybe a, a, a change is, is, you know, change, you know, to, to all of us who've been around a, a while, you know, the instinct change is bad. Um, but if you can look past that, maybe there will be some new looks saying that the Zaluzny, uh, if you will, um, led military in the aggregate have done, there will be history books written about what the Ukrainian military did uh, the first six months, the first uh, year, the first two years, and the, new, and the new general will be part of that history because he was instrumental at the army level in, in, in fighting. So they're going to get their, we're going to work their way through there. Um, um, but no, nobody likes to see uh, public differences. And again, I think the most important thing is we've seen publicly that uh, Vladimir Zelensky and General Zaluzny um, have publicly um, um, worked to transition and turn over well. Um, uh, Zaluzny received a hero of Ukraine publicly. Um, they embraced, and I think both realized that they, they need to figure it out. And there will be a role for Zaluzny one way or the other. And yes, there are concerns about political aspirations, but that's down the road. General Zwack, we always appreciate your time. Thank you so much for joining us today on Frontline. Hey, thank you for uh, the invitation and uh, uh, God bless our British friends and allies. Thank you for watching this episode of Frontline for Times Radio. For more on the war in Ukraine, subscribe to the Times Radio YouTube channel. Listen to Times Radio on your digital radio or you can read the Times online with your digital subscription or in print. Thank you and goodbye.